the Experts webinar with representatives from the Kurt Vonnegut Memorial Library and the Center for Ray Bradbury Studies. From the Vonnegut Library, we have Chris Lefebvre. He is the Vonnegut Library Curator. And from the Bradbury Center, we have Jonathan Eller, who is the director there. And I'll let them tell you a little bit more about themselves when they speak. Um, my name is Beth Yates. I'll be your host this afternoon. I'll be manning the chat box, so if you have any questions at all during this webinar, please type them in that box on the upper left-hand corner of your screen, and I will get them to our guest speakers whenever there's a good opportunity. Um, we might actually just wait and do questions at the end, though, so there will be time at the end to ask questions. Don't worry. One more item of business before we get started. I will be sending out one LEU for this training via email to you guys in the next few weeks. Um, please don't worry if it doesn't come like in the next few days because it will probably take me at least a week or so to get them to you um, and they will get to you i promise so without further ado i think we are ready to get started let me get um let me get jonathan's powerpoint up here bear with us as we do technical things there we go. All right, here we go. This is Jonathan Eller. Thanks very much, Beth. And it's good to be with you all today for, for this uh, webinar. Uh, this would be magic to Ray Bradbury. It's a little bit of magic to me as well. But he was thrilled to see how technology uh, allowed people to have access to books more uh, frequently and m more accessibly than uh, ever before in history. And by the end of his long life, he was able to uh, authorized a lot of his books to go into ebook status, uh, even though he preferred to touch books, to feel books, to listen to the way they sound when you ripple the pages. He figured the electronic world was a good world as long as the people who run that world are responsible about it. That's sort of the bottom line motivation for writing and, um, and uh, working on Ray Bradbury. That's what brought me to Ray Bradbury. As Beth said, I'm John Eller or Jonathan Eller. You'll see it both ways. Uh, the last 23 years of Ray Bradbury's life, I had the great good fortune to know him and eventually to work with him on a number of projects. And we set up the Center for Ray Bradbury Studies about nine years ago now at IUPUI. I co-founded it with my colleague uh, Bill Tuponce, since retired. Uh, Bill and I had uh, done a lot of work on Ray. He had published books. And since uh, the center went up, I've put together uh, several volumes on Ray, including uh, biographies. So here we are to talk about the Center for Ray Bradbury Studies, but also Freedom of the Imagination, because it's Banned Books Week. The Center for Ray Bradbury Studies there uh, is in the Institute for American Thought uh, in the Indiana University School of Liberal Arts, which is on the IUPUI campus here in Indianapolis. You see some of our publications there. You see a book I did with Bill Tuponce in the bottom left, The Life of Fiction which was really the first university press book on Ray Bradbury, if you can believe that. Uh, no matter how far he permeated into American culture, it took a while, I think, for both Bradbury and for Vonnegut to get these kinds of publications uh, by scholars out there. Uh, you see the gray titles there are, are collected stories of Ray Bradbury, which uh, we're just finishing up volume three now. Uh, these volumes uh, cover really the first decade of his seven-decade career, the 1940s, when he was moving uh, successfully through the pulp genre magazines and then into the mainstream magazines and then becoming one of the most recognized authors of our time. We're collecting the early versions of those stories in that series. You see the new Ray Bradbury review on the bottom right. We're on issue five now. And then two of the three biographies I have on Ray are in print, Becoming Ray Bradbury, Ray Bradbury Unbound. I'm working on a third one now. These comprise the publications in and around the Center for Ray Bradbury Studies. That issue five I just mentioned of the new Ray Bradbury Review is one of the things that's kind of tied into Banned Books Weeks uh, for this year. Uh, issue five is a special number commemorating the 50th anniversary of Francois Truffaut's film adaptation of Fahrenheit 451. Uh, that film adaptation was made in 1966. And you see here the cover. Uh, this is available now through Kent State University Press. We just got our copies, so I'm assuming you'll be able to get them either through Kent State University Press or uh, through Amazon, whatever the sources are that people work with. OK, talking about Banned Books Week and really the year-round freedom of the imagination Bradbury Center activities, I think, is a, a good thing to highlight for you. 
uh, again this month, uh, rather into October of 2016, you'll see the release of the new Ray Bradbury Review 50th anniversary issue of the film Fahrenheit 451. On October 3rd, I'm doing one of uh, one of my regular stops down at uh, Franklin Road Branch Library here in Marion County, uh, which uh, they've had me back for four years, so I guess I'm doing okay by them. We have uh, a discussion on the October Country from 1955. All those early light horror weird tales that Ray wrote were pulled together in a volume that was kind of edgy to publish at the end of the climate of fear in America when uh, when the comic books and graphic representations of such things were being burned and finally uh, out and out censored. Uh, his stories in the October Country brushed on the edge of all that. So it's an appropriate book, I think, to cover this year down at the Franklin Road Branch. Later in October, I'll be going up to uh, do a National Endowment for the Arts Big Read lecture on Fahrenheit at Albion College in Michigan. Uh, and, but I also give periodic lectures on Bradbury for book clubs at branch libraries all around central Indiana. We've done a lot of the Marion County branches, some of the Johnson County branches, Delaware County. Uh, and then uh, I also, we also will go out when we can, when uh, counties are able to get a National Endowment for the Arts grant, we go out and we'll do a big read on Fahrenheit, at least as long as Fahrenheit is on the list for the big read, which I believe uh, will be uh, through 2017. Uh, and then the books a mix will shift. In the works, we're looking at setting up a librarian seminar or series of seminars on Ray Bradbury and the preservation of libraries since antiquity. Uh, and we include material on Bradbury's efforts to preserve freedom of the imagination those efforts span nearly 70 years of American culture because he was a professional writer for 70 years from 1941 until his death in 2012. What do we have at the Center for Ray Bradbury Studies? Well, essentially, we are an archive and scholarly publishing operation that has suddenly become also a museum and a gallery because uh, thanks to gifts from the Bradbury family and a Bradbury benefactor, uh, Professor Don Albright of the Pratt Institute in Brooklyn, uh, who was a very close friend of Ray's, between Don Albright and the Bradbury family, we received all of Bradbury's remaining papers and his 31 filing cabinets and metal file boxes. So we have 123 pages of his papers. Um, a personal and professional correspondence from really the last 40 years of his life which is really helping me as I'm getting ready to write the third biography volume over the last 40 years of his life. And so there are 10,000 pages of letters and attachments. Then we have tons of awards and gifts, uh, really a lifetime of memorability, memorabilia and awards. Uh, on the walls here, you see uh, in the right-hand picture, the north end of our archive, you'll see uh, a lot of awards from NASA, the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, Mars rover teams for spirit and opportunity, the early rovers had landed in the mid-2000s. Viking 1 and 2 Mars missions from the 1970s. The Lunar Orbiter team uh, gave him uh, awards and, uh, and actually uh, uh, printed uh, photographs from the orbiter missions of the 1960s. The Mars Thermal Emission team at Arizona State University gave him and actually allowed him to push buttons to do some imaging of the Mars uh, South Polar area. Um, the Mariner 9 mission team uh, uh, gave him things in 1971 when Mars was first mapped, including a globe of Mars, which you see there in the bottom right uh, uh, photo, uh, which was from the mapping that uh, that survey, that orbital survey conducted in 1971. The National Space Society uh, given him a number of awards, the Planetary Society, Gemini and Apollo mission astronauts whom he knew and who, whom he ins inspired uh, through their own lives. Uh, things from the 22nd Space Congress and even the Russian Science Academy because he's globally significant to why we explore and why we want to go to outer space. You see there our archival room with his files and uh, our, our reference library of his books. His films are also there in the south wall area which you see in the bottom left photo along with some of the lost papers on our 16 foot long table there and I'll get to those in a, just a few minutes. Now our mission basically is to generate funding for preservation of one of the largest single author archives in the nation. Uh, we provide a lab environment for digital imaging for museum studies and public history grad students involved in preservation curatorial studies because we have um, all these uh, artifacts for them to work with. 
We provide a lab environment for recovery and textual editing for our professional editing graduate program here because we have so many versions of his work preserved. You can see how he revised and also how editors expurgated his work, sometimes accidentally and sometimes intentionally. Uh, we are trying to generate a broad public outreach through our expanding museum and gallery facilities and provide an interdisciplinary research archive and teaching resource for students and faculty. You see in the photo there, the, our recreation of his office, uh, is, uh, which is slowly beginning to look exactly like in the same dimensions of his basement office that he worked in for over a half a century. You see here his bookcases, his books, uh, his typewriter desktop artifacts, and uh, this was taken during the clean phase before we cluttered it up with all his magic and memorabilia, <laughs> which we're in the process of doing right now in the Bradbury Center. Sample of some of the awards he has. Remember, this is a writer, one of the best known writers of our time, who never went to college a day in his life. And yet he's the winner of the National Book Award Medal for uh, Distinguished Contribution to American Letters, a Pulitzer Prize for Professional and Deeply Influential Career, a Lifetime Award, and then the National Medal of Arts, presented by the President of the United States in November 2004. He also has a number of uh, the NASA artifacts. There's a close-up of that globe, globe from the Mariner 9 missions. And then you have his Grand Master Science Fiction and Fantasy Writers of America Award from 1989. And one of his two Emmys, this one for The Halloween Tree, a Best Animated Feature Screenplay for his feature-length animated film in 1993. So that's a sample of the kinds of artifacts we have. Uh, there's one, uh, one more here. Uh, here is his Jules Verne Award, which he was given for Lifetime Achievement in the Space Age. You note from the booklet there that uh, his friend Buzz Aldrin was also a winner, as were uh, most of the Star Trek uh, space captains, uh, William Shatner and Patrick Stewart. This is NASA's symbolic Martian flag. It was um, uh, designed uh, to go up to the space station, uh, the International Space Station on the shuttle Discovery, and it was returned by the Discovery for presentation by the Planetary Society of Ray, uh, when he was in 2005 awarded the Thomas O. Payne NASA Award for Advancement of Human Exploration of Mars. These and many other artifacts are preserved in the Bradbury Center, some, a very few of which, like the Mars flag, have actually been to outer space. Here's those last lost papers I promised you. In addition to more than 110,000 pages of papers in those filing cabinets, these materials represent the Bradbury papers that were still in filing transition during his lifetime. And we have really the honor and the privilege and, and really an exciting job of, of uh, uh, sorting these uh, papers into categories, uh, publications, correspondence, lots of treasures. We find more and more every day. It's exciting, and I just wish we had more manpower and time to work on these things. Uh, the filing cabinets, as you can see, it's a Bradbury treasure trove. Here's just one drawer in one of those 30 filing cabinets. Uh, they contain more than 100,000 pages, and they were moved from Los Angeles uh, from his home after he passed away to the Bradbury Center at IUPUI with the contents intact. As you can guess, it's very difficult to, to uh, detect the order sometimes, but it is the author's order and we're trying to preserve that as best we can, as well as the condition of the contents as we begin probably a decades-long effort once we raise some funds to do preservation work. Here's a drawer like many others that have complete works uh, the drafts of complete works uh, with tantalizing titles like a box of Bradbury unused stories from 1950 to 1985, uh, the illustrated man, one man dramatic adaptation, and then uh, almost final versions of his 1989 novel Graveyard for Lunatics. Now each year the Bradbury Center mounts a month-long ex ex exhibition in the IUPUI Cultural Arts Gallery. This year's exhibition is scheduled for the month of October. The show will feature famous illustrations of the imaginary Haas houses that, that haunt or enthrall readers of his books, as well as the houses he lived in through his long life. This is the house he was basically born into in 1920 in Waukegan, Illinois, and that is a very young Ray Bradbury, about 1926. This will be in the Cultural Arts Gallery uh, in, the, um, in the Student Center, in the Campus Center uh, at University and Michigan on the IUPUI campus. Now, to wrap it up, well, we've talked a bit about his uh, being a visionary for the space age, but something that ties into, I think, uh, uh, why Beth brought us together to do this today are the things he also stands for in the 21st century, uh, and like Vonnegut, will keep him in the public eye, keep Ray Bradbury in the public eye. Uh, that is his 
lifelong work for freedom of the imagination, for the precious gift of literacy, and for the preservation of libraries. Here, during the seven-year arc from the forming of the uh, House on american Activities Committee shortly after World War II, right through the McCarthy era and the height of the climate of fear in 1953, 1954, Ray wrote stories that got their way, uh, moved him toward writing uh, Fahrenheit 451. I wanted to pull up Carnival of Madness, uh, which was, it's, you'll find it in the Martian Chronicles as Usher 2, of course. And here's a paragraph where the builder of, of Usher 2, that is uh, the House of Usher, uh, which is designed to punish with all of Poe's horrors, all the people, all the bureaucrats, all the leaders who have banned imaginative literature in the far future. And this is what the creator of that house says. They began by controlling books and, of course, films one way or another, one group or another, political bias, religious prejudice, union pressures. There was always a minority afraid of something and a great majority afraid of the dark, afraid of the future, afraid of the past, afraid of the present, afraid of themselves and shadows of themselves. Great text for Banned Books Week, isn't it? Mm -hmm. He also, again, around 1950-51, wrote The Pedestrian because he felt pedestrians were an indicator species for, for growing authoritarianism. If we start considering people who walk at night instead of sitting in front of the TV enslaved to it, uh, if we start considering them abnormal people and stop them from walking, that would be the beginning of authoritarianism. And here's what his pedestrian is saying to himself as he walks the last night he'll ever be allowed to walk. Hello in there, he whispered to every house on every side as he moved. What's up tonight on Channel 4, Channel 7, Channel 9? A quiz? A review? A comedian falling off a stage? He stumbled over a particularly uneven section of sidewalk. The cement was vanishing under flowers and grass. In ten years of walking by night or day for thousands of miles, he had never met another person walking, not one in all that time. It was only a small step until, within weeks of writing that story, he wrote Fahrenheit 451 as the fireman, as was originally published in 1951. In 1953, when he expanded it in to Fahrenheit 451, with the opening lines, very famous, it was a pleasure to burn, was published. It was then serialized in early issues of Playboy magazine. It was uh, the subject of a Playhouse 90 uh, 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 television drama lawsuit uh, for plagiarism. Uh, and then uh, when he finally was able to get an authorized version of it made, it was by 1966 for Francois Truffaut's film. Actually, from 1967, really through the 1970s till about 1978, there was an expurgated uh, Ballantyne High School edition out there that uh, accidentally got mixed in with the trade edition. And for a number of years in the 70s, uh, you could only buy a censored version of Fahrenheit and no one knew it. Uh, finally, school children figured it out by comparing their copies with their parents. And uh, after a St. Louis area school notified uh, Ray Bradbury, he had his text restored. And now, of course, it uh, was a founding text of the National Endowment for the Arts Big Read. So that's his great anchor, uh, with many supporting anchors, as you've seen, for his freedom of the imagination legacy in America. He would say that the important thing is libraries. They are more important than colleges or universities because libraries are free. The important thing is that knowledge should be free. You shouldn't have to pay for it. But today's library is also in the cloud. And as we, we may remember, I think it was just seven years ago, a very Bradbury-like cautionary tale happened when a major distributor of e-books uh, in, in order to, to uh, take action against one of their uh, their subsidiaries that was not following contract rules in selling the e-books uh, actually recalled the books that had been sold by that subsidiary company. And suddenly people that thought they had bought their e-book and downloaded it from the cloud had it retracted. Uh, and these included copies of George Orwell's 1984 and Animal Farm, Ayn Rand's The Fountainhead, and even J.K. Rowling's Harry Potter novels. If you happen to have bought it through that sub-distributor, you had a surprise when your copy disappeared back into the cloud. So a lot of the things that Ray Bradbury said in Fahrenheit 451 are still relevant in our high-tech world today. This is what he said about freedom of the imagination, uh, really about the time Fahrenheit came out. He said, consider the similarity of two books, Kessler's Darkness at Noon, 
late in our recent past, and George Orwell's 1984 set in our immediate future. And here we are, poised between the two, between a dreadful reality and an unformed terror, trying to make such decisions as will avoid the tyranny of the very far right and the tyranny of the very far left, the two of which can often be seen coalescing into a tyranny, pure and simple, with no qualifying adjective in front at all. Fahrenheit 451 has survived all these years. An anti-authoritarian novel published at the beginning of the, uh, or at the height of the climate of fear in America, still selling over 200,000 copies a year. Uh, it's a remarkable legacy uh, in the area of freedom of the imagination for Ray Bradbury. Uh, and here is a, I think an app photograph. Uh, uh, my friend Chris Lefebvre loves this photo as well. He'll be talking to you in just a minute. But here we have uh, a, a photograph by the, the master photographer Yusuf Karsh in 1990 showing Kurt Vonnegut and Ray Bradbury together. They are definitely genuine originals and they definitely walk that margin between popular literature and um, high critical literature and they were never afraid to speak out their minds about uh, intolerance or societies who say there is no such thing as intolerance. I'll leave you then with just resources on contemporary and historical patterns of censorship. Here are books that I use as I'm beginning to try to pull together uh, the seminar I hope we'll have as early as next summer or the following uh, academic year. These are books that really talk a lot about the history of censorship through time. The Basbane's book and the Battles book give deep uh, looks at uh, uh, the, the fates of libraries back through antiquity up to today. Nobles is more of a book uh, set uh, are focusing on the, the, the 200 and some years of the American traditions in uh, libraries and publishing. Noel Perrin's book is, talks about a particular history of expurgated books in England and America. But I would recommend that your libraries keep Ken Waksberger's series, Banned Books, somewhere in your library, uh, main library or branch or school library, wherever you happen to be. These are four hardbound books that aren't terribly expensive. And they cover really the, the contemporary or 20th century history of banned books uh, based on these uh, volume specialization, which uh, there's one on political grounds, one on social grounds, one on religious grounds, and one on sexual grounds. And I find all these books great resources when we're talking about freedom of the imagination and censorship, especially during Banned Books Week. Thanks so much. Thank you very much, John. I love that picture. That really was perfect for today. Um, we're going to get Chris. Oh. Over here, that's all right, I got I it. Just one, I, ooh, can oh. we go back to the last slide oh, sure. for just a second? There we go, there it oh, is. Okay. Yeah, uh, that's just, uh, if, you, if you would ever like to follow up with us, that's, that's our website address and our Facebook, which is very active. And if you want to see how we do our things, uh, how we're trying to strive toward internships and for our publications and for preservation, go to those sites and let us know um, uh, if you'd like to come visit us or talk to us about any of our efforts. Thanks a lot. Over to Chris now. All right. Get Chris's PowerPoint up here. Oh, there yeah. you are, look, sir. Look at, look at that cover page. <laughs> okay, am I live? All right. Yeah, you're live. This is Chris Lefebvre from the Vonnegut Library. Hi there, everybody. Um, I'm suddenly looking at this cover photo and thinking I should have put our address on there. We are located at 340 North Senate Avenue at the corner of Senate and Vermont Street. Uh, we are across from Bourbon Street Distillery, so you can mold a pork tenderloin sandwich into your visit to the Vonnegut Library. Mm. Um, oh, and here you go. You got a, on the left. That's a picture of our current location as part of the Amelie Building. On the right, you're going to see the new building that we uh, signed the lease on at 646 Mass Avenue. Uh, we just got through a Kickstarter campaign. We are uh, going to move a gift shop in there pretty soon. Uh, the goal is to open the full museum in April of 2017 as part of Year of Vonnegut Part 2, because uh, the first year of Vonnegut was 2007, uh, when the famous author passed away at the age of 84. Let's see, I, I'm going to put together a list of our programs here. Um, that is most of what we do. We are a library and museum dedicated to the memory of legendary Hoosier author Kurt Vonnegut. Uh, he was born to a very prominent family here in 1922. His great-grandfather Clemens founded Vonnegut Hardware Store here. Uh, Kurt's grandfather Bernard and his father Kurt Vonnegut Sr. were also very prominent architects here. So if you've ever been to the Athenaeum before, uh, that's Kurt's grandfather's building. Uh -huh. Yep, Heron High School is one of their buildings as well. Uh, the old Unitarian Church at 1455 North Alabama Street is Kurt's father's building. Uh, would have been about all the religion Kurt was exposed to over the course of his life, which, uh, which I think plays a pretty big role in why he's so often challenged in his writing. 
Um, Slaughterhouse Five, Cat's Cradle, Breakfast of Champions. If you ever wonder why Breakfast of Champions was banned, uh, occasionally just turn to page five. <laughs> um, and Welcome to Monkey House uh, was it was even censored in Canada, I believe. Um, and I'm going to go through some of these programs here. Uh, Teaching Vonnegut, we host every July. It's run by our education director, Max Goler. I believe it's about five days long. Uh, they, it is accredited for anybody who's, uh, who's also a teacher or connected to a bunch of teachers here. Uh, the Kurt Vonnegut and Jane Cox Vonnegut Writing Awards are scholarships that we do. Um, basically, Kurt Vonnegut was a veteran of World War II, a survivor of the bombing of Dresden. Uh, he was captured nearly immediately upon entering the war at the Battle of the Bulge. And uh, basically what happened was his father had written him a letter that we have in our collection at the Vonnegut Library. And Kurt never opened it, even though he was gone for many, many months. And in the middle of the letter, it says, Return to Sender. It says, Missing January 7th, 45. Uh, so, yeah, we have that on display in the library at all times. And basically what happened is that we have a competition that we do with uh, Shortridge High School students as to what they think is in that letter. And we judge it based on the quality of the writing. Um, so that's pretty cool. We do uh, we do So It Goes, which is our literary journal. We've released it every year since 2012. Uh, we do it via themes, and it's full of local writers, people that knew Kurt Vonnegut. Uh, I've gotten some other well-known individuals in there, and it's also uh, geared towards veterans. Uh, Mark Vonnegut, when we opened the library, wanted us to have a, pro have a veterans organization uh, along with the library. So this year in November, as part of Vonnegut Fest, we are going to be releasing the new edition of that and to go with the Bicentennial. Um, it's going to be an Indiana-themed issue. Uh, Night of Vonnegut is an event we held uh, every year in April. It is around the anniversary of Kurt Vonnegut passing away. Uh, this most recent year, in 2016, we had, uh, we had a guy named Steve Amon come and be the, the keynote speaker, and the scholarship program is awarded that night as well. Uh, Vonnegut Fest is coming up. Uh, in November. It'll be November 10th through 12th, 2016. Um, it's going to start off with reclaiming Armistice Day. Vonnegut was born on November 11th, 1922, which was the four-year anniversary of the original armistice of World War I. And uh, so part of that is going to be Steve Inski from NPR hosting an event that Thursday night. Uh, the Friday night we're having a Vonnegut session um, that's oftentimes music and art based, but this time around we're going to be showing the, uh, the movie Breakfast of Champions. At, uh, at the, I believe that's being held at the Vonnegut Library, but I'll double check that. Um, but on Saturday is the main event. We're going to have uh, Peter, I, I wrote the guy's name down. He's the host of Wait, Wait, Don't Tell Me, based out of Chicago. Peter Sagal. Peter oh, Sagal. Yeah. Um, yeah, he's going to be the, uh, he's going to be accepting the Kurt Vonnegut Humor Award at, uh, at, at, at Vonnegut Fest. And so that's going to be a really cool weekend. So definitely mark your calendars for that in November. Uh, we do hold school tours all the time. Um, so that's uh, that's something you'd want to contact me about. Uh, we have special exhibits quite frequently. We're working on a Slaughterhouse Five exhibit for the new edition for the new building. Uh, art shows as well. We have traveling speakerships, and uh, last but not least, we have a traveling exhibit that we can send out to universities and libraries. Quick question about the free tours. Okay. So is that you just show up and if somebody's free, they give you a tour, or is it a certain time? Uh, no, no, no. You can come in any time. Okay. Uh, I mean, there, there are definitely going to be moments where there's stuff going on in the library sure. and you may have to jump in in the middle of a tour and we try to get you back around to the beginning of it as fast as possible. Um, but yeah, we're, uh, we, we give award-winning tours. We, uh, we're guaranteed, you know, there, there are parts of Kurt Vonnegut's life. He, uh, he really had a gift at taking the scary and dark things in life and making you both laugh and cry about those things simultaneously. Mm -hmm. And I, I think we, uh, we put that into work. We put that into practice quite well in our tours. Thanks. Um, so I want to talk about Band Book Weeks a little bit, uh, Band Books Week, sorry. Uh, in 2011, we did have a college professor from Republic, Missouri, uh, re request that the local school library remove Slaughterhouse Five from its shelves. Uh, said that there's a false conception of American history and government and teaches principles contrary to biblical morality and truth. Uh, basically, there's a there's a line in Slaughterhouse Five where Vonnegut is saying that uh, that Jesus. Uh, should have been. Uh, they shouldn't have pronounced that he was a son of God. He's, he says, if we were going to, if you're going to kill someone, make absolutely well sure that he's not well connected first, and, uh, and that Jesus should have just been an ordinary bum, and then after they killed him, God could go, you know, get very, very angry. <laughs> and uh, so that was the point that he was very, very angry about, and said, we got to get rid of this book. 
Uh, the school board voted unanimously to remove it. The Vonnegut Library responded by offering free copies of Slaughterhouse Five to any Republic High School student who desired one. Uh, after over 75 books were mailed and national attention was given to the issue, the book remains behind the library counter, only available for checkout by parents, like a dangerous, dangerous weapon. Mm -hmm. uh, this was not Kurt Vonnegut's first experience with censorship, uh, and, and as I already mentioned, those books have uh, gotten him into some hot water, too. Uh, but the subject of banned books go, does go way beyond Kurt Vonnegut. Um, we've had modern challenges to the uh, book, let's see, Invisible Man by Ralph Ellison. I believe that happened in 2014. Uh, they found out that the head of the school board actually had not read the book. Uh, but the school board, yeah, that was pretty embarrassing for them. Huh. Uh, but those kind of issues happen all the time. Uh, I'm going to be reading myself from Henry Miller's Tropic of Cancer, which is frequently challenged. Uh, all the way from uh, from books that you have a hard time believing that they were ever challenged, such as Shel Silverstein's Life, Light, Lights in the Attic. Uh, people were pretty upset that there was a short story in there where they talk about children breaking dishes instead of washing them, which I'm a 33-year-old man, and I still throw dishes away instead of washing them. <laughs> uh, this is our first Band Book Week in 2012. Corey Michael Dalton, a local writer who is known for, uh, he just recently published a book called Mythic Indy. Uh, it's got a lot of contributors to it. He was living, he was our first victim, the first person to live in the front of our library as a protest against censorship. And uh, this was our first time experimenting with it. We had, uh, we, had a, we had a prison made in the inside of the Vonnegut Library made out of a bunch of books. Um, but in the, back in the day when we didn't have quite as many resources, it was basically me driving around Indianapolis and checking out as many banned books from the uh, Indianapolis Public mm -hmm. Library as I possibly could. Uh, luckily, we found a more efficient way of getting that accomplished. But, yeah, this is an interesting study in claustrophobia. Plus, that's our CEO and director, Julia Whitehead. Uh, this is her in the process of arresting Corey for the crime of reading banned books. Uh, so she is dressed as a police officer. Those are large 70s sunglasses. Uh, she also had bejeweled handcuffs and a uh, and a baton with her. So that was that was pretty cool. You definitely want your boss to do that if you're thinking about banned book week programming. Uh, this is Hugh Vanderveer from 2013. As you can see, that is the wall of banned books. It was a little larger that year. Uh, we had a couple of private donations and uh, and some volunteers went to their local public library to help me out with the drive around Indianapolis. Um, this was a very cool year as well. We had uh, we had a lot of local artists involved. They were doing reimagined covers of Kurt Vonnegut books. Um, Emma Overman was a contributor. It was a, it was the neatest animal farm cover on the face of the planet. It was the the pig sitting there with like fancy beverage and uh, and a nice pipe, and uh, he had his feet up on the table. And of course, there was the the bones of the cow or the horse underneath the uh, underneath the underneath the room, looking all ghastly and stuff. It was pretty cool. Um, over here, you've got Tim Ude, and I, I think I think um, I think Jonathan already mentioned this, but uh, the photograph occurred in Ray Bradbury. This was the year that he brought in the desk that Bradbury wrote some of Fahrenheit 451, and you can see Tim uh, typing the very tail end of it. Uh, believe it or not, we had beer brewery catering this event with uh, with beer out of plastic cups and a, and a rock band called Kilgore Trout playing in the background. Uh, but it was pretty neat. The only mistake we had that night was uh, we, we had the band facing uh, away from the sun, so the audience was staring at the sun. Uh, but other than that, it was a pretty wild evening. And you can see in the bottom right-hand corner, you can see the lighter fluid. And uh, that is the lighter fluid from my house. Uh, I was te texted earlier that day, and the lighter fluid I used to make hamburgers was brought to the Vonnegut Library uh, so that we could take his copy of uh, Fahrenheit 451 that he typed on two taped-together pieces of paper and light it on fire. So yeah, that was a pretty cool day. Wow. Uh, we we still have that uh, that charred plastic that charred paper in the Vonnegut Library. We have we have that preserved. Um, but yeah, this is uh, this is Rick Provine from DePaul University. As you can see, the prison made of banned books has gotten absolutely enormous at this juncture, thanks to kind donations from both DePaul University and Wabash College. And uh, this was a pretty wild night. This was a proud, pretty wild week as well. We had the artwork exhibit put up there on the wall as well um, and then one of the highlights there was talking about music and how that is connected to uh, to band book week censorship uh, provine is a huge frank zappa fan and he's been a subject of quite a bit of controversy himself but we did start talking about albums that are connected to band books such as animals by pink floyd uh summer teeth by wilco is connected to uh to the collection um it is connected to tropic of cancer by henry miller um, jazz music's played a huge role in that. Uh, Jack Kerouac's On the Road has been subject to many uh, criticisms uh, for a variety of reasons. And, and uh, Wardell Gray, uh, Charlie Parker, Lester Young, they're all referenced in there. 
Um, so that, that, that created a lot of interesting discussion while we were in the library. It's uh, one of the highlights of coming to the library during Band Book Week is the, is the excuse to meet our guests because uh, they're usually working on a project at the time, and it's, uh, it always leads, it leads to very interesting conversation. Um, so here's what's coming up. We already had the Corey Dalton and uh, Devon Kondaki. I'm going to mispronounce that name. I feel bad about that. Uh, they already did their reading today. Uh, Kondaki read from Vonnegut's children's book, Sun, Moon, Star. Uh, that was really neat. Corey Dalton read from Alice in Wonderland, and uh, of course we had the, the understandable conversation about the Jefferson Airplane song, Ride Rabbit, uh, after that. Um, Dungeons and Dragons and 80s Satanic Panic is going to be going on tonight at 6 p.m. Uh, it's free. Uh, we got the sponsors of Gen Con. Michael Whitwer, the, con the author and historian, is going to be talking about the uh, Dungeons and Dragons game and how parents at the time were pretty concerned that that game was based in the Satanic world. Um, sure enough, we have a bunch of Mountain Dew and uh, potato chips at the Vonnegut Library, if you guys want to participate in that. Um, Doritos, we found out, has 2% vitamin A. <laughs> I never knew that. Really? Uh, yep, tomorrow at noon, we're going to be hosting Constance Macy. She's going to be doing a dramatic reading uh, from Judy Bloom and her book, Forever. She has been a, a, a longtime fan and friend of the Vonnegut Library. I saw her read Howl in its entirety once while uh, while a guy was playing bass in the background. She also did I Am Waiting by Lawrence Ferlinghetti. Uh, so she is quite a talent. You definitely want to grab a sandwich and uh, spend your lunch break at the Vonnegut Library tomorrow. Um, tomorrow evening at IPUI, we're going to have a, a, a mock discussion about banned books uh, involving the IU McKinney School of Law. Um, so that's going to be pretty neat as well. Um, tomorrow is going to be cool. We got Katie, Katie Blair from the A Indiana ACLU and Kit Malone from Freedom Indiana. Uh, they're going to be reading selections from their favorite band books in the evening at the Vonnegut Library. We're going to have an event called Censorship and Women's Bodies. Um, that's going to be involving uh, Christina Hale. She's running for Lieutenant Governor. Uh, Kit Malone of Freedom Indiana is also going to be there. Uh, L. Roberts of Sheehive and author, author B Betsy Blankenbaker has been involved with the Vonnegut Library for a long time. Uh, the, there's definitely limited spaces, so if you're going to sign up for that, do it soon. Um, but we're all looking forward to that event. Um, there's a noontime event on Thursday. Amber Stearns and Barbara Shoup are going to be reading from, uh, from their favorite books. Uh, Jacqueline Woodson, we're going to be hosting that at DePaul University. And uh, that's going to be going on Thursday night at 7 p.m. We're going to have two of her books there for sale. Uh, she's quite an award-winning author, so I, if I were you, I'd sign up for that event pretty quickly as well. Uh, Friday, the grand finale, we're going to have Dan Wakefield, a uh, favorite author of Indiana Hoosiers. Um, we're going to have, he's known for the book Going All the Way, which Vonnegut wrote a review of. Uh, Vonnegut's review might as well be banned. It's, uh, Vonnegut mentioned that it should have been called Getting Laid in Indianapolis, so I'm sure that <laughs> offended someone. Um, he's, his favorite bar in Indiana is, um, is the, um, oh, I'm going to blank on that, what's the bar in Broderpool that he goes to? Uh, the Red Key, the Red Key Tavern. Oh, okay. yep, yep. Yeah. That's Dan Wakefield's mm -hmm. favorite local haunt, and uh, he's going to be coming and reading from his uh, from one of his favorite books here at the Vonnegut Library. And of course, I will be reading on noon at Friday as well. Uh, so grab a sandwich, come on down your lunch break, and hear me read from Tropic of Cancer. Um, it's amazing. The most offensive thing in that book is uh, is his descriptions of bed bugs. I, that was what really turned turned my stomach. Really? Uh, but yeah, 6 p.m. Uh, is when uh, is at Short Ridge High School. We're going to have morning marketplace morning reports. David Brancaccio. Uh, there's going to be a big panel about how we're going to talk about Kurt Vonnegut's idea of the Secretary of the Future, which uh, which no one had ever heard of at the time. But sure enough, uh, sure enough, in Sweden apparently they have a Secretary of the Future now, uh, really? which is a pretty cool job description. Yeah. Um, so yeah, here uh, the last thing I wanted to publish was actually from Kurt Vonnegut. Uh, it's a letter that he wrote to a guy named Mr. Well, okay, I'm gonna actually get the real name of Mr. McCarthy. Uh, but he's the head of a school board in North Dakota where they actually lit, uh, they put a bunch of Kurt Vonnegut's copies of Slaughterhouse Five in an incinerator uh, because a regular fire wouldn't do the trick. It says, "Dear Mr. McCarthy, I am writing to you in your capacity as chairman of the Drake School Board." I am among those American writers whose books have been destroyed in the now famous furnace of your school. Certain members of your community have suggested that my work is evil. This is extraordinarily insulting to me. The news from Drake indicates to me that books and writers are very unreal to, your, to you people. I am writing this letter to let you know how real I am. I want you to know, too, that my publisher and I have done absolutely nothing to exploit the disgusting news from Drake. 
We are not clapping each other on the back, crowing about all the books we will sell because of the news. We have declined to go on television, have written no fiery letters to editorial pages, have granted no lengthy interviews. We are angered and sickened and saddened. And no copies of this letter have been sent to anybody else. Uh, this book, this letter was released in 1980. Uh, you now hold the only copy in your hands. It is a strictly private letter between me to the people of Drake who have done so much to damage my reputation in the eyes of their children and then in the eyes of the world. Do you have the courage and ordinary dis decency to show this letter to the people, or will it, too, be consigned to the fires of your furnace? I gather from what I read in the papers and hear on television that you imagine me and some other writers, too, as being sort of a rat-like people who enjoy making money from poisoning the minds of young people. I am, in fact, a large, strong person, 51 years old, who did a lot of farm work as a boy, who is good with tools. I have raised six children, three my own and three adopted. They have all turned out well. Two of them are farmers. I am a combat infantry veteran from World War II and hold a purple heart. I have earned whatever I own by hard work. I have never been arrested or sued for anything. I am so much trusted with young people and by young people that I have served on the faculties of the University of Iowa, Harvard, and the City College of New York. Every year I receive at least a dozen invitations to be a commencement speaker at, coll speaker at colleges and high schools. My books are probably more widely used in schools than those of any other living American fiction writer. If you were to bother to read my books to behave as educated persons would, you would learn that they are not sexy and do not argue in favor of wildness of any kind. They beg that people be kinder and more reasonable than they often are. It is true in real life, especially soldiers and hardworking men speak coarsely, and even our most sheltered children know that. And we all know, too, that those words really don't damage children much. They didn't damage us when we were young. It was evil deeds and lying that hurt us. After I have said all this, I am sure you will still be ready to respond. In effect, yes, yes, but it still remains our right and our responsibility to decide what books our children are going to be made to read in our community. This is surely so. But it is also true that if you exercise that right and fulfill that responsibility in an ignorant, harsh, un-American manner, then people are entitled to call you bad citizens and fools. Even your old children, our own children are entitled to call you that. I read in the newspaper that your community is mystified by the outcry that all over the country about what you have done. Well, you have discovered that Drake is a part of American civilization, and your fellow Americans can't stand it that you have behaved in such an uncivilized way. Perhaps you will learn from this that books are sacred to free men for very good reason, and that wars have been fought against nations which hate books and burn them. If you are an American, you must allow all ideas to circulate freely in your community, not merely your own. If you and your board are now determined to show that you, in fact, have wisdom and maturity when you exercise your powers over the education of your young, then you should acknowledge that it was a rotten lesson you taught young people in a free society when you denounced and then burned books you hadn't even read. You should also resolve to expose your children to all sorts of opinions and information in order that they will be better equipped to make decisions and to survive. Again, you have insulted me, and I am a good citizen, and I am very real. Kurt Vonnegut. Um, that's my PowerPoint presentation, and uh, I'm sure there's stuff I missed, so I hope we get questions asked of us. Yeah, so at this time, you guys, if anybody has any questions at all or any experiences you want to share, if anyone has attended any of the events in the past, maybe at the Vonnegut Library or plans on attending this year, go ahead and type them in the chat box in the upper left-hand corner. Um, we have a request um, that I send the presentation, so we have another request. We're going to send the PowerPoints out, right? Okay. Okay. Yeah. Um, and I'll definitely, I'll be sending a link of this training um, out with your LEUs, which again, I will send your LEU in the next couple of weeks. Um, it won't be immediately, but it should be, you know, in a couple of weeks. And with the LEU, I will send a link to this recording. Oh, okay. So we have a question. <clears throat> Jane would like to know how to find out what the file for Ray Bradbury's unpublished stories has in it. <laughs> well, take this. I hate to uh, demystify the magic a little bit. Uh, in 1985, he still had uh, uh, a number of his earlier stories that hadn't been collected into story collections. Uh, but if you look at the story collections he put together from that point on, um, uh, story collections like the Toynbee Convector, Driving Blind, Quicker Than the Eye, um, uh, One More for the Road, on up to We'll Always Have Paris, 
in 2009. He continued to publish story collections, and he would pull stories out of that box and other boxes and seed them into those collections. So uh, if you want to drop us a note, we can, we can tell you a lot about that history, or come visit us if, uh, if that's ever possible for you to do in the Bradbury Center. Um, we have another question, if you guys can hear me. Uh, Orton wants to know, has Fahrenheit 451 been challenged often? Oh, well, it's been challenged in court. Um, it also, uh, the censorship of it in the 1970s resulted in a uh, National Library Association ruling that uh, 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 books need to uh, clearly state when they have been abridged for any reason whatsoever or they will, not be they will not be eligible for certain prize categories. Um, I would say that Fahrenheit has been uh, censored here and there, as was the Martian Chronicles uh, occasionally, but Fahrenheit uh, uh, quite often, not as much as Slaughterhouse-Five. Um, I think the Drake case for Slaughterhouse-Five ended up in a Supreme Court decision that addressed the issue of the uh, viewpoints of the school board members uh, really should not have any play whatsoever into the school board's decision. It should be reasoned and clearly articulated when, when uh, a book is removed from the student school reading list. So Fahrenheit, uh, probably uh, a little less so than Slaughterhouse-Five, uh, gets its knocks from time to time because there's a little bit of language in it. Um, Erin Cataldi says she loves the Vonnegut Library. Hi, Erin. Hi, Erin. Um, <laughs> and she needs to visit the Ray Bradbury Center next. And Joe Dillon, oh, uh, are you familiar with the movie Footloose? Um, he says he can't think about Slaughterhouse-Five without thinking about Footloose's quote, yeah, it's a total classic. So I guess I need to watch Footloose again. I haven't watched it. Yeah, I, I, I will say I do... I do not like a lot of Kenny Loggins music, but I, I, I do love the song Footloose. Like that's 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 a great tune. That's that's a good dancing song. Oh, Joe's adding something else. Um, let's see what he says. Anybody else have any questions or comments that they want to make? I'm so thankful for both uh, John. Oh, we have a couple more. Both John and Chris coming in today, taking time. I know this is a busy week for both of you guys. Um, a few more people typing. And Are you going to go to Bourbon Street after this and get a bacon cheeseburger? Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's all I'm thinking about right now. Oh, Joe says it's during when the townspeople raise a fuss about the school children or we're reading it. Oh. So, yeah, okay. Yep. Now I have to go back and watch that movie. I do remember that town did not like a lot of... They didn't like They didn't dancing, like dancing. They, so they were anti-dancing, yeah. I'm not too shocked that they wanted to ban books. Um, let's see. We've got something from Jane coming. Anybody else? Anything else? Jane says, I, may, I met Ray Bradbury when I was in college, uh, or when I was a college student in L.A. He was very kind and gave great advice to my writers group. You know, he was so, so inspirational, not only to uh, people in the space program or to librarians and teachers, but to all the people who loved the things he loved. And uh, he was always good to his fans. A Ray Bradbury autograph is not a rare thing. He would always go out of his way to sign, even after um, his hands were crippled up. Uh, uh, the last uh, 12 years or so of his life, he was able to uh, continue to sign and would sign tirelessly for people and encourage students and teachers, uh, readers, fans, astronauts, anybody who read and enjoyed the things he enjoyed. Yeah, Kurt, Kurt Vonnegut was actually quite similar in that regard. We hear a lot of personal stories. We get a lot of fan letters that are signed by Kurt Vonnegut. And Kurt Vonnegut's signature was uh, was no laughing matter. That that thing required a whole lot of... Uh, <laughs> if, if you do a Google image search on Kurt Vonnegut's uh, signature, you'll see a whole lot of complication in that. <laughs> I'm, I'm not sure I could reproduce it. Um, that's after five and a half years of being with the Vonnegut Library. So, yeah, he, uh, he was incredibly friendly to people generally. One more thing. All right. Well, oh, she says, yes, he listened to me talk about my son, who at that time was little and was afraid of the dark, and he had written a children's novel on that topic. Yes, yeah, Switch on the Night, published in 1955. Turn off the lights and look at the light from the stars. It's a wonderful image. Yeah. All right. Well, I think that seems to be it, unless anybody else is going to start typing all of a sudden, but I don't think so. 
So thank you, gentlemen, for, for coming and speaking to us about what your uh, organizations do. Um, it's a great thing, and I think the library world is thankful for it. So, yeah. Um, Thanks for having me. We will uh, send out LEUs and a link in a few weeks, and we're going to sign off for now. Uh, we'll stick around in case we have any remaining questions, but I'm going to turn off the, the microphone. So thanks, guys. <laughs>